Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Gonzalez. Welcome to our International Infectious Disease Video Conference. Today, we have a very interesting case presented by uh, one of our fellows, uh, Dr. Carlos Plazola from University of Miami. I hope you like the case. Dr. Plazola, you can take over. Thanks. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carlos. I'm one of the ID fellows here at the uh, University of Miami Jackson. Uh, so yeah, let's start with the case. Okay. So this was a 59 year old man that came to the Bascom Palmer uh, Eye Institute, which is the like the ophthalmology institute here at uh, Miami came with a painless loss of vision in his right eye and floaters in his left eye for one day. Um, he only reported a headache. That was the, the only other symptom. Didn't have any fevers or any, and any other symptoms whatsoever. So they proceeded with an exam that showed panioveitis, subretinal, retinal, uh, choroidal inflammation, and vitritis. And they did a of these findings, they did a tap and cultured uh, both his right eye and his left eye, and he uh, was transferred to the general ER just for, for further workup since it seems like it was a more serious case after receiving uh, intravitral uh, antibiotics and, and antifungals, vancomycin, septacidim, and, and voriconazole in both eyes. Okay, so... He was then transferred to the Jackson uh, Memorial Hospital emergency room where he, his initial physical exam, he was afebrile with a heart rate of 82, blood pressure was 40 over 87, and he was saturating 100% um, uh, in room air. Pertinent positive findings on the, on the exam, he had conjunctival injection in both of his eyes and a two out of six systolic murmur. Um, but his abdomen was soft, non-tender, and he was alert and oriented to person, place, and time. Didn't have any focal deficits. Otherwise, the exam was uh, unremarkable. Now, just taking a step back on, on his history before we go with the, with the rest of the case, he has type 2 diabetes. Uh, he's on metformin, but it's unknown what his A1C was. He hadn't been in, in the hospital for a long time or in the clinic. Uh, also had hypertension uh, and did go to a recent emergency room for nausea and vomiting after he ate a, a bad sandwich. It was, was treated, uh, supportive care, probably a food poisoning, and then he was discharged. In terms of social history, he was born and raised in the, in the U.S. and lives in Miami Gardens with his wife, has three dogs, but no cats, works as a driver of a trash truck, um, doesn't use any drugs or um, smoke cigarettes, smoke marijuana in his 20s, but not anymore, and occasionally drinks a few beers, but not a, not, it's not a daily drinker. Uh, and sexually is active with only with his wife uh, and hasn't traveled uh, anywhere outside of Miami recently and doesn't visit farms or is exposed to farm animals. His initial labs showed a white blood cell count of 13 with a neutrophil predominance of 84.81.4%. Um, they obtained blood cultures that were with no growth uh, at one day. Uh, ESR was 78, like a, a, a Erythrocyte sedimentation rate was 78. The C-reactive protein was uh, 24.6. His glucose was 240. You know, he has diabetes, and otherwise his labs are unremarkable except for a lipase of 354. Uh, his HIV screen was negative, and his hep C, uh, hepatitis C screening was negative as well. And in terms of uh, the initial radiology that we had, um, 
we had this x-ray on the left side that was pretty unremarkable. Uh, there was no infiltrates, no consolidations. Um, and uh, this was a CT abdomen pelvis that was, that was gotten since he reported this uh, nausea and vomiting a few days ago um, that showed this hypodense lesion in the left liver lobe that was read up eight mil as eight millimeters in size uh, that was not seen in previous studies and that it might rep might have rep represented a cyst. Uh, okay. The initial antimicrobials that they started was cefepim and vancomycin. And yeah, just be before we go to the next, uh, you know, next part of the case, uh, just with this information that we have, I don't know if anyone has any differential diagnosis in mind or any questions that they want to ask uh, before we before we go on. Hi, Carlos. Thank you. Any recent travel? No, no recent travel. So I think when thinking about pan uveitis, um, like to break it up into kind of two categories, maybe even three: infection, some kind of autoimmune disease, or if there's some kind of traumatic injury, <clears throat> works the trash collector. So maybe that's a, definitely a possibility. Um, as far as things to be concerned about right now, <clears throat> probably thinking about syphilis, maybe tuberculosis. So he doesn't seem to have any uh, exposures that you've told us about so far. Um, and then maybe start like an autoimmune workup for like lupus, uh, sarcoid, something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think someone raised their hand. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Villegas. Hi. <clears throat> Hi. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I want to know about more, uh, if you have any more history about the recent visit to the ER because of the bad sandwich, because uh, you, you're presenting someone with mul multiple uh, uh, infectious sites, uh, different that suggest like any, for me suggesting any uh, something like metastatic, meta metastatic infectious uh, uh, sites. So what about, you have a more history about that visit to the ER because of the bus stand, did they do, did they perform any tests, any, any, anything uh, around that? Yeah, they, they, he came like five days before this presentation to the, that I was mentioning. Uh, his vitals were within normal limits. Uh, labs were normal. Did He didn't have a white count like this time. Uh, and that was not nothing concerning. Uh, so he was discharged. Uh, just assuming this was a, a case of food poisoning, he improved with like fluids and and supportive care, uh, like anti antiemetics, and then he he was just discharged. He didn't have any eye symptoms at that time when he when he when he presented. Thanks. Good morning. Do we have a description of what the ophthalmologist saw in uh, his evaluation? Yeah, they saw uh, the the panuveitis in both eyes uh, and uh, subretinal and subcorridal uh, inflammation and vitritis. That's why that they described. Okay. And in the physical exam, there were no skin lesions that we were seeing. No, there, he had no skin lesions. Okay. And you mentioned he had a murmur. Did we know in the past that the murmur was there or it's new as far as we know? Like no heart conditions that we know of. Yeah, so as far as we know, the murmur was new. Uh, there was no prior documentation that he, him having a murmur. Okay, thank you.
Uh, I think we can continue with the case. Okay, yeah. So I'll continue. Um, so at that time, we, we were consulted, our team. Uh, so with the, with the murmur, the liver lesion and ocular findings, there was a suspicion for infective endocarditis. Um, so that's kind of like where, where our team uh, was coming to to propose a, our recommendation. So diagnostically, we recommended blood cultures, a transthoracic echocardiogram, an MRI of the brain, a CTA of the abdomen, because the patient and that initial visit with us said he still had, uh, not his, he still had, uh, that he was having severe, severe abdominal pain. Uh, not like when he presented before, this was this was a, a new finding. And he had cultures and studies from the from the other eye institute. Uh, we were gonna follow that follow those up, and therapeutically stop the cefepime and started ceftacidine for better eye penetration and continue the vancomycin. There was a study uh, that showed that ceftacidine penetrates into the vitreous cavity of inflamed eyes after intravenous administration and achieves concentrations of the MIC for pseudomonas. Uh, so that was the the, the reasoning to for the switch. Uh, and uh, we asked for a transthoracic echo and MRI of the brain. So the results are, this are the results. Let me just, this is a video. So uh, the transthoracic echo, I don't know. If this is the be best quality that I could get. It was me recording from my uh, screen, but they described the 0 0.9 mobile density in the anterior mitral valve tip. Uh, Collapsing into a left atrium and systole and left ventricle and diastole. And they described it as a possible ruptured cord or a vegetation. And the MRI of the brain showed uh, a fossa of restricted diffusion in the cerebellar uh, hemisphere bilaterally, uh, which they described representing as a, a small infarction. This is one of the fossae that, that they mentioned. Um, and otherwise, the, the MRI showed um, meningeal enhancement in the right uh, sylvial and, and anterior fissures and right frontal lobe that was suggestive of meningitis. Um, they also described an additional right frontal subarachnoid susceptibility, which could represent a subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, possible hemorrhagic meningitis. That was the whole description of the, of the MRI. And uh, okay, next one. Uh, we asked for the CTA of the abdomen and the pelvis, and the CT and the CTA of the head and neck with and without contrast was also obtained. The CTA on at, on the left. I don't know if it's really a, you can guys can appreciate it, but they showed a complete occlusion of the celiac artery with soft tissue attenuation and surrounding the vessel that extended into the confluence of the splenic and hepatic artery, as well as the left gastric artery, uh, likely representing thrombosis with surrounding inflammatory changes and otherwise uh, no other uh, lesions were seen. And the CTA of the head, um, this is the best picture I could find. We can see them, we can see uh, see it over there on the, on the right side of the brain, left side of the screen, they describe the circumscribed hyperdensity in the right sylvian fissure, which associate uh which uh, associated with his history uh raises the possibility of a small aneurysm in the right uh M2 segment of the middle cerebral artery. At that point, based on this findings, uh more consultants were brought were brought up into the case, neurology and cardiothoracic surgery. Neurology said that given that the patient had known endocarditis and that uh, that was like the source of the emboli, there was no need for a uh, lumbar puncture and to avoid anticoagulation and antiplatelets in the setting of uh, septic emboli with risk of hemorrhage. And cardiothoracic surgery recommended a TEE, like a transesophageal echocardiogram, and that given the recommendation of neurology to avoid anticoagulation, the risk of cardiothoracic surgery awaited the benefits at that time. And the patient remained. The patient remo was remained clinically stable uh, despite all these findings. So now, uh, just gonna go like 
day by day, I guess, uh, or like more chronologically, see what 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 we got in terms of diagnosis and therapy. So this is at day three. So two days after we initially saw him, the bug cultures were still negative, and the cultures from the from the other hospital, the the cultures from the eye were completely negative. Uh, they didn't grow anything, and um, so we asked for the transfer of a GLA core cardiogram, continuous sept septacidim and vancomycin, and then uh, ophthalmology injected again in his eyes with both uh, his both eyes with the antibiotics and antifungals. They did mention that the endophthalmitis was behaving very aggressively, and there was high concern for gram negative rods, which is why the next day we switched to uh, omeropenem given worsening eye findings. And uh, we started, since the cultures were still negative, started the culture negative endocarditis workup. Transesophageal echocardiogram was still, was still pending at that time. Um, the next day, uh, the transesophageal echo was obtained. It showed a, a one centimeter mitral valve vegetation with moderate mitral valve regurgitation and no evidence of perforation or, or abscess formation. And uh, the blood cultures were completely negative. Uh, uh, Bartonella, PCR and serology were negative. Brussel IgG was positive. IgM was negative. Coxella PCR in blood uh, and serology were negative. Cryptococcal antigen in blood was negative. The fungital assay or, or better the glucan in the blood was more than 500. So that was a positive result. The histoplasmic urine antigen was negative. And based on, because of the uh, uh, CTA of the head findings, neurology recommended a digital subtraction and geography. And we continue the meropenem and the vancomycin. Okay. So I don't know if at this time anyone has uh, more like in terms of uh, etiology of, of the endocarditis, any thoughts or any more questions, anything that they like to ask or comment before we proceed. But this should, we should this should be more, uh, uh, no, just, just about the etiology if anyone has any comments. Uh, Carlos, quick question. Uh, so the blood cultures persist uh, negative at this point. How many days have passed with uh, negative cultures? So the the cultures there was because uh, that was a day five. So the cultures from emission were negative, and then they obtained blood cultures the two days after that that were negative at day three. But we already had one set that was completely negative after five days, like four sets. Sorry, four bottles. But, but, you know, one day of blood cultures that were completely negative at day five. Uh, hi, Carlos. This is Jorge Alave. Um, does you have, or that, 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 that you perform um, gene sequence? Because if you have a patient with a, uh, negative cultures, and obviously you need uh, another, um, another, uh, another method, no? So in another context, and is and it's very rare the in marantic uh, endocarditis and limbal sac. No, you you suspect long infectious diseases, but uh, it's very important to rule out the infectious disease. No? So for this reason, I don't know if you if you perform a sequence a gene sequence. Yes, yes, we did perform it, but that, that that's coming. <laughs> but yeah, we we did perform uh gene sequencing. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna continue. Uh, so at the, at at day eight, um. We recommended to to reconsult cardiothoracic surgery, but they continued. They at that point they, they still couldn't anticoagulate, so the, the surgery had to be postponed. And we sent the gene sequencing specifically carious testing. Um, then then the digital subtraction and geography was done, and confirmed the 
the 2.8 by 2.4 aneurysm in the uh, MCA uh, that was likely representing a mycotic aneurysm in the setting of his known bacterial endocarditis. At that point, um, just empirically, uh, mycofungin was started that was quickly switched to boriconazole bur afterwards, and another intravitreal injection of an antimicrobials was, was injected in the patient size. Uh, and on day eight, uh, the, the, the microbial cell-free uh, DNA test, the Ascaris test, came back positive for Aspergillus fumigatus. That was the only microorganism that was detected. Um, you can see like uh, uh, a little picture from the test, that report that we got. And uh, at that point, we stopped the meropenem and vancomycin. We continued voriconazole and we started on fluterosin B uh, together with the voriconazole and uh, voriconazole was injected in the patient size. Okay. Um, so at this point, uh, it was just waiting for a few days until uh, the patient was able to be anticoagulated. So everyone, even us, uh, the neurology team kind of like stepped, stepped down from the case for a while and then came back to the case on day 29 um, when he uh, ultimately got his mitral valve replacement. Uh, and uh, at that point also continued on for tyrosine B and boriconazole and diagnostically, uh, we already had, you know, the mitral valve vegetation with the mycotic aneurysm, a fungital assay that was, uh, or beta diglucan assay that was positive. Uh, we also had aspergillus galactomanning in the blood that I didn't put before. Uh, that was 1.4, which was a positive result. And the caries test for aspergillus fumigatus was enough suspicion for us to do to, to diagnosis as fungal infective endocarditis. Um, so at this point, it was just waiting on, on, on mitral bulb culture and biopsy that were sent, the actual bulb that was sent during the surgery, uh, which initially was negative, uh, therapeutically, amphotericin B had to stop given nephrotoxicity. So it would, the patient was on boriconazole, uh, uh, only. Then the mitral bulb biopsy showed acute on chronic endocarditis with numerous septate, branch, and hyphae, morphologically consistent with aspergillus. The patient was still on boriconazole. This is how, this is a picture of the, <clears throat> sorry, this is a, the, the picture sent from to us from the pathologist. Uh, that show the, the hyphae. Uh, some, some branching and some septations can be seen. Uh, but, but yeah, clearly you can see the hyphae. Uh, and uh, then on day 37, the mitral valve culture was positive for, <clears throat> for aspergillus fumigatus, nine days post-op. This is not the, the picture of our micro lab uh, because uh, I wasn't able to get it, uh, but this is how aspergillus looks when it grows in the uh, uh, culture. And we continue the voriconazole which we knew, you know, uh, it was aspergillus at this time. And day 38, then at that time, we we all the diagnosis of natural, my, native mitral valve infective endocarditis secondary to aspergillus fumigatus, complicated by bilateral endogenosum, dophthalmitis, septic embolization of the brain, celiac artery, liver, and the mycotic brain aneurysm. And at that point, uh, we started mycofungin because it was subtherapeutic um, on the voriconazole. So he was both on boriconazole and mycofungin. Um, so now we can uh, talk a little bit about aspergillus fumigatus. Uh, some some review that that I did about what I find in, in the in the literature. Um. So and then we we can just finish after this with with questions and comments and everything. Uh. So fungal endocarditis uh, accounts for for less than 10% of the full infective endocarditis cases in aspergillus uh, species account for 30% of those 10% of cases, second only to candida uh, species. So the risk factors include uh, intravenous drug use, immunosuppression, malignancy, and the presence of prosthetic valves, uh, which in, in which the, the literature says that the infection occurs 
um, most likely at the time of surgery. Uh, like the inoculation happens during the surgery and then the patient develops that the, the endocarditis could be uh, months or years later. Um, there was a, a study that, that, that reviewed some cases that so aspergillus fumigatus accounted for 54% of the cases, uh, Terius 18%, Niger 7%, and Flavus 7% as well. Uh, patients typically present with fever and metabolic phenomena, like we saw in our patient, uh, although he didn't have a fever. Uh, this uh, review also showed that the vegetations uh, are often large and involved in mitral and uh 49% of the cases they reviewed the 53 patients and aortic valves uh, or aortic valves <clears throat> and that the complications were common and frequently involved embolization to the pulmonary ophthalmic cerebral iliac coronary hepatic splenic renal brachial and or mesenteric arteries that we saw that our patient had um in terms of diagnosis the blood cultures are rarely positive uh the util and the utility of the galactamining assay had not been studied in 2010, but then in 2016 there was a review that that showed that uh, um, and they performed a spergillus PCR, beta glucan and galactamining testing, and the PCR was positive in seven out of seven of the seven uh, patients that were tested. The serum beta glucan was positive in six out of the seven, and um, they got aspergillus galactamining in 10 of the 16 patients, 10 of 16 patients. And in four of the 20 patients, all three tests were negative. But the the gold standard for diagnosis remains the histological and, and tissue culture, like we saw in our, in our patient. <clears throat> and uh, the treatment of, of endocarditis for aspergillus in general, it's it's largely guided by by the evidence that we have from other forms of invasive aspergillosis. Um, specifically for endocarditis, the treatment often requires medical and surgical therapies, um, but the mortalities are still approach 80% despite uh, optimal therapy. There was a, 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 a study as well that showed there was the mortality was almost 100% despite optimal therapy. And the boriconosol remains the antifungal agent of choice for aspergillus and endocarditis. But I do want to mention here that for the some some the the literature says that for impaired coverage of fungal endocarditis without the species, uh, the treatment is like uh, liposomal amphotericin B. Um, just going a little bit more into detail, uh, the the routine the. Seems like the, the routine use of combination therapy is not recommended in most guidelines because there's no uh, definitive randomized clinical trial data to support it. Uh, but there was a study, uh, a randomized clinical trial in 2015 that showed that um, uh, there was com combination with boriconazole and anidolefungin showed improved outcomes, but it, it failed to show statistically statistical significance. Um, and posoconazole and isobuconazole are their preferred or alternatives um, to voriconazole. Both have been shown to be as effective as voriconazole and to be better tolerated in randomized, ran in randomized trials. And we, amphotericin B is generally reserved for patients that cannot take ASOLs, that have severe hepatotoxicity, <clears throat> or are, uh, are resistant, have resistant isolates to, to, to voriconazole or ASOS. Um, in terms of duration, I mean, this is the duration for invasive endocarditis, six to 12 weeks, uh, sorry, aspergillosis, but we'll go, uh, we, I have more cases at the end that, that show a, a little bit uh, what was some, some, some specific cases, but there's no data on the optimal duration of, of especially of combination therapy. This same study that I mentioned before uh, showed that two to four weeks, uh, was the, the 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 combination therapy uh, duration that they used, and the actual the median actual duration was fourteen days, and in cases of endocarditis, the patients have to be on lifelong suppressive antifungal therapy with an oral um at the same doses that were used for treatment. So this is this is just to finish. This is some of the cases that I found. Uh, 
on the literature. Um, it was just going like, let's say, uh, top to left. There was a this was an Aspergillus fumigatus native of endocarditis in an otherwise healthy adult from 2016. Um, this was interesting because they described that they they didn't see they didn't there was no cases in patients that were otherwise healthy with uh uh without the risk factors that I mentioned that to their no knowledge at that time this what that was the first case that was in <clears throat> here in the United States and the therapy that they used was four weeks of dual antifungal therapy with intravenous voriconazole and fluterosin B. And then the patient was discharged home on lifelong oral voriconazole. Um, then the next one below that one, uh, it was a case of cardiac device related aspergillus endocarditis in a patient with a pacemaker and a bone marrow transplant. Um, of course, this is not exactly our patient, but just in terms of this was in the United States as well, just in terms of therapy for us just to have like some uh, some idea. They they use intravenous uh, boriconazole uh, and he was just that he, that was the only treatment he got, like fungal treatment, I guess, uh, boriconazole. And then he was discharged home and indefinite suppression with oral boriconazole. Then the one below that one that was in the medical mycology case reports in the United States as well. This the 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 I guess the 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 interesting part of this case was that it was diagnosed by serum antigen testing. That was what they focused on. That they it demonstrated the utility of obtaining serum beta, serum beta D glucan and galactomannan in a patient. Uh, this patient had prosthetic valve endocarditis, but initially the cultures were negative, and they started the empiric treatment based on this uh, um, non-invasive testing, antigen testing that we could have, we, that's kind of like what we what we did as well in our case. And in terms of treatment in this case, they uh, initially the patient was an aflatoxin B, but had to be discontinued because acute kidney injury. And he ended up being a mycofungin plus voriconazole. However, this patient uh, unfortunately uh, passed away during surgery. Uh, then there was a case in Italy. Then that's the next one. Uh, that was from 2023. Uh, that was also native of aspergillus and docarditis with no known uh, risk factors. They did a liposomal amphotericin B plus that isobuconazole. However, this patient uh, also passed away during surgery, they described due to vascular complications. And uh, lastly, this is an interesting case that I found uh, that showed uh, an endocarditis vasperdilus fumigatus in a patient nine months after COVID-19 infection. Uh, this was a case in Iran. Um, and he, this patient was treated, this is a, there was a, this was a, a woman around 50 years old. Uh, initially on Fluterosin B, but then was switched to Voriconazole, and they treated for six months, and that the patient was followed by uh, seven months after discharge, and no further complications developed. Uh, this was published just uh, a few months a few months ago in December twenty twenty three. Today it's interesting because for our patient we really didn't find a, um, I guess a risk factor. But now we have this case, for example, with COVID-19 that we know can cause all this uh, immune modulatory changes. Uh, but we know we, we uh, unclear if the patient had COVID at some point, no, it's possible, but, but that was not a question that we asked intentionally in this case, but something to think about. Um, and yeah, that's... Uh, these are the reference that I, references that I used, and yeah, that's that's the whole case, the discussion. Here's a picture of my home city, Caracas. <laughs> Very nice picture. Uh, we have a question in the chat in terms of the eye findings. Uh, did the eye findings uh, improve uh, with the treatment? Yeah, the, they improved and the patient, yeah, after surgery, 
uh, which is when I started to see him, uh, he he said he didn't have a his eyes his vision was greatly improved. Uh, he didn't have pain. The headache was gone, and he he was able to you know to have more visual acuity. He he it, it, he improved. Yeah. Go ahead, Doctor. I love it. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for the presentation. Excellent case. So uh, I have had a little question about the treatment. Yeah. Uh, during the treatment, uh, I I I saw in your slides uh, you changed the treatment because the problem with the uh, renal failure and after to the level of the polyponazol. Yeah. So, uh, and you present. Uh, one case of uh, amphotericin B and isobuconazole. I yes. don't know if you consider in doing the rounds uh, when, when you approach the patient the isobuconazole as the treatment because is the isobuconazole have a interesting profile because don't need um, um, a measure of the level in the blood. No? Do you consider isoconazole to treat it in this case, or or or, or, you, or you continue with uh, with the treatment that you propose? Uh, initially, I mean the the that during those days that, that I mentioned, uh, I don't think it was considered. Uh, I think I guess the reasoning for for treatment was initially he wasn't the boriconazole uh, on its own since since you know it's a it was the as a treatment of choice, but then the amphotericin B was added uh, as part of combination therapy. But there was there were also questions also because of why I mentioned that that if combination therapy is effective or not. But uh, it was started because of the the clinical picture and the severity and the high mortality. Then the amphotericin B had to be stopped because he developed renal failure, um, and he stayed on bariconazole um, alone, uh, which. According to some of the cases and some of the literature, it, it could be appropriate. Uh, but the thing was that the levels kept on being, uh, let's say, subtherapeutic. So mycofungin was started because of the same thing, like the the severity of the of the uh, aspergillus endocarditis, just to 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 add and and provide some extra coverage uh, while the boriconazole kind of levels. Uh, improve you know get 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 to therapeutic levels so that was kind of like the reasoning for treatment however uh this of course this case was really long uh the patient's still in the hospital uh this was around october and the patient it's still in the hospital right now so um actually the patient is now on isobuconazole but because he developed qtc prolongation that i mentioned that isobuconazole it's one of the alternative therapies and he actually had to be uh switched to that uh I think a few weeks ago because of QTC prolongation. But at the initially it wasn't it, it wasn't part of the plan, you know, it was changed now because of the QTC prolongation. Go well, ahead, hey, Dr. Castro. Um yes, uh I was involved uh, for a um, significant time of um the care in this patient. So just one reflection is that, um, you know, we're discussing rounds about the need of second antifungal therapy because it was, um, I mean, the guidelines just just one, but um, nevertheless, he, he had two antifungals on, but despite of that, the uh, aspergillus grew after those weeks of therapy the aspergillus grew in the valve when it was resected. So I, I think, you know, that point is just to to think about how ineffective are the current antifungals to treat um, aspergillus endocarditis. Um, and the second point is, yes, he's still in the hospital and he has developed a very unusual uh, complication that is um, mycotic aneurysm but it's caused by a mycobacteria. So I wonder if he has some unknown immune 
uh, deficiency that we have not found yet. Because it's very unusual to, to develop um, narcotic aneurysms uh, with mycobacteria. And that was proven by culture and biopsy. Over. Uh, Dr. Castro, quick question. Uh, the biopsy was taken from uh, what side to, to prove that it was mycobacterium? It, was it the vessel itself or? Yeah, they, they resect the vessel. Oh, okay. Into the abdominal. I see. Thank you so much. Uh, at the beginning, I, I, I uh, joined in a little later. In the beginning, um, there was, uh, in the MRIs, there were some findings compatible with mycotic aneurysms in the brain. And that's why the, the surgery was delayed. The, the thought was that that was caused by aspergillus. I mean, obviously, you have the aspergillus in the blood, microbacteria, and now present with a mycotic aneurysm in the brain. That certainly was never proven. But now, the, the one the uh, abdominal area, uh, that was, um, he was taken to surgery for it. And, and the pathology was, um, you know, granulomas, and, and it's growing because we haven't identified yet the specific mycobacteria, but it's a slow grower. Um, so I, I just, um, you know, question that he must have some type of uh, immune deficiency that we have not found. Yeah, that will definitely uh, will complicate the treatment. I guess uh, if it is a slow growing mycobacteria, I mean, part of the treatment I will say that might be uh, rifampin. So we have to keep in mind the interaction between bariconazole and rifampin, and I think uh, that's one of the reasons in this situation to choose uh, uh, Cresemba isoflaconazole in the long term will be easier to to deal with these interactions in the long term. But, but that's an amazing case. I mean, I wasn't expecting this. Uh, to happen, so a co-infection in a patient may be immunocompromised. So definitely immunology has to be on board to see if he has any primary immunodeficiencies going on and predisposing to this complication. Yeah, that's a very interesting case, definitely. Anybody else would like to uh, add any comments or any questions, please? He's uh, actually in rifabutin because of the interaction, as you said. I just have a question. In terms of duration for aspergillus uh, endocarditis, I mean, their literature, I think it has like several um, ways to approach it. Uh, in this situation, I mean, surgery was done. Uh, apparently, that's the main uh, part of the treatment. Uh, considering that, for how long do you anticipate to treat this aspergillus endocarditis? I mean, I guess based on the literature um, and, you know, how aggressively it presents, I, I think the patients need, to, seems like the most of the cases, what they said is basically they're treated for life and it's the same dose because it's says that the, the suppression should be the same dose that the, the patients were, get, were getting for treatment. Uh, the only case that I saw that uh, that they stopped the, the treatment after six months was that, was that case in Iran. But all the other cases, I mean, two of the patients passed away and then two of them stayed on a lifelong voriconosol. And, you know, the literature, yeah, they, I mean, said that the duration is, 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 you know, unclear. Uh, I guess most of most of them said that the therapy was you know lifelong. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, seems like that's kind of like the case, and what practically in others in other uh, hospitals in other countries they're doing that as well.
And in terms of the mycobacteria, I mean, is that something that you expect treating like for, I don't know, uh, this situation is, uh, I mean, this is very atypical uh, to me. I haven't seen any similar case like this, uh, but mycotic aneurysm possibly, I mean, endocarditis uh, caused by mycobacteria. Do you expect a long treatment as well? Six months, a year, lifelong? Uh, I mean, for the mycobacteria, yeah, that part I didn't include here because it was, uh, said, we said, <laughs> um, sure. maybe it was going to be too much to cover, but uh, I believe that the patient right now, I mean, Dr. Castro can correct me, but uh, from what I read uh, yesterday, I believe the patient's on empiric treatment still because we don't even have a species yet. So uh, we're assuming it's uh, a slow grower because I think it grew at 21 days. But but to ex yeah I don't know I guess it it'll depend but it will probably be a longer a long treatment or I guess it depends on on you know what this finding brings uh in terms of his immuno immune function you know if, if he ends up that he's actually immunocompromised or has some some you know deficiency I guess that'll that'll influence decisions in treatment but I think right now yeah it's probably planning for a long course. At the beginning, he was uh, placing uh, empiric treatment for both rapid grower and slower grower because uh, it grew kind of, um, you know, around the borderline. But eventually, it was clear there was a, a slow grower. Um, and the thing also that I guess the, the theory was that would have make our lives easier. There was a rapid grower, maybe consequence of a line that he had had for, you know, for a long time. But um, even though his life had been changing, but he never had um, mycobacterial cultures. So if that was a line complication, uh, you know, could have been approached for uh, shorter courses. But now, you know, being a, a slow grower, that, you know, changes the, the prospects. So um, the sample have been submitted for uh, identification and uh, susceptibility testing. But yeah, he's going to lend, uh, probably uh, need a long-term uh, therapy with. Yeah, the fact that it grew from the, the tissue, I guess, uh, from the vessel, I mean, there is no question that it's a real pathogen. I mean, when we uh, face a slow grower sometimes, I mean, there is a, a species, uh, Mycobacterium cordoni, that, that is typically a contaminant and we almost never treat. But I mean, in this situation, I mean, it, it is clear that we need to, uh, to give treatment. I mean, if it is from the vessel, there is no question about uh, pathogenicity of this organism. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I think that's an amazing case. Uh, and the, the and the outcomes uh, in the long term. I mean, uh, I mean the patient got surgery and is already on the right treatment. But I will love to see uh, how, what happens in the in the near term future. I mean, this is a very complicated case. And thanks for presenting that. Uh, before uh, finishing, anybody else? Uh, any further comments um, about the case? Oh yeah, Doctor Villegas, please go ahead. Hi, I think one of the highlights of these cases is. The, the importance of uh, that every day is getting more important in ID is the, the PCR methods for diagnosing, for quick diagnostic. Uh, this is a great sample, uh, a, a, a late culture that has to be taken when the patient was in surgery quite a few weeks later. It, this this represents the importance of adding uh, molecular stories in our diagnosing and the, the growing need for for having this technician in our countries, in our center and everything. It's something that I, I like to highlight about this case, because in my country, we don't have like, a, we don't have many molecular methods for ID. So we lack, we lack for, uh, we, we miss certain diagnostics if, uh, because of this. So that was like my comment. And everything. Thanks. 
Uh, any, uh, just a quick uh, question. I mean, probably this is a stretch, but I mean, sometimes mycobacteria is, a, I mean, we know it's a waterborne organism. And sometimes, I mean, it could uh, be a complication from surgery. I mean, contamination. Is that something that has been considered maybe a water contaminant? Uh, maybe there is any procedure that he got, got introduced in his bloodstream. Is that something that you think is possible here or is uh, worth it to explore or not really? Um, I think most of those cases are rapid growers. So um, I guess in theory, it depends what grows. And we also want to, you know, given this concern and me having TB under consideration, uh, we want to quote unquote rule him out for, you know, pulmonary TB that could have reactivated. Um, yeah, um, mycobacteriums yeah, certainly are uh, complications of many surgeries, in particular um, intravascular. But as far as I know, most of those cases uh, are rapid growers. Um, so, I mean, if, if this is mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, I mean, we'll have to change our approach completely to see what, what's going on. Great, thank you very much. And I think with that, we finish uh, the conference. Thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you again in four weeks, All right? Thank you, have a nice day. Uh, for the fellows, please uh, stay in the Zoom meeting. We'll have uh, some things to discuss. For the rest, uh, thank you so much and we'll see you soon.